So actually for the sake of time, I decided to focus on just one of the artists um, that I wrote about, uh, Nadia Meyer, and I'd like to begin with a quote from her. Um, Meyer is a Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabe artist based in what is not now Montreal, Canada, who describes her prolific body of work. Um, my interests in art making have been predominantly focused on the deconstruction of lingual and material languages as a method of understanding. I'm equally interested in the story, collective memory and wounds, as it relates to the colonization of, of Anishinaabe people. In Meyer's Landscape of Sorrow, and everything I know about love, pictured here, unprimed canvas serving as both frame and material is stitched and or torn to resemble skin in various states of repair and or rupture. And I'll show you. This ambiguity suggests that the works do not illustrate an act of wounding that is grammatically perfect, done, finished, complete but rather indicate the present fact of having been wounded, and further, that there are doers behind the deed who must be held accountable in the present for perpetuating settler colonial legacies imbricated in state-condoned state acts of violence against First Nations women. Meyer's interactive Indian Act, a seed bead on paper series, performs community and pushes participants and viewers to consider that their personal stories might intersect with a larger group of individuals who feel mourn and imagine justice. And um, Indian Act is unique in the, question, in the works in question here because it's not, um, it's not a canvas-based work, based work and it's very interactive. As Glenn Coulthard and Mark Rifkin have argued, British and French Canadian settler colonial projects demanded that Native peoples make their kinship systems, which so very often operate as governance, legible to the Canadian parliamentary government by reconfiguring diverse sex gender systems to binary nuclear family-based models tied to marriage and progeny. Meyer's Indian Act inverts the demands placed upon Native nations for lodgeability, exposing the illogical nature of the settler state. And I'll show you Indian Act. The detail, another detail. I mean, it's a, it's a long series. There are pages and pages like this. Um, Indian Act reconciliates reconstellates this series of Canadian laws in its printed entirety by expressing it within the purview of beadwork, a form of Native women's contemporary cultural production. On her website, the artist describes her project. Through weekly beading bees, more than 230 people participated in beading over the 56 pages of the annotated Indian Act, replacing the letters of the law with red and white glass seed beads. And you can imagine what, a, what an endeavor this was. Um, the Indian Act was first uh, instituted in 1876, and there are various amendments and permutations since. Um, beading circles are common among Native women today who create regalia for their friends and relatives for social events and competition. The collective nature of beading recenters proper relations, practice between and among relatives, tribal communities, and even non-Native peoples. Um, the participants, for example, in Meyer's project were not exclusively Anishinaabe um, or exclusively Native peoples as central to Native identities, rather than the static status Indian. Bright red and white beadwork renders the legal language unreadable and unintelligible, reflecting its circuitous, obscurant nature. Meyer's project, active, collaborative, creative, refuses stasis and status, insisting that this major legislative act itself become readable, their form of indigenous cultural production. So the Indian Act has mediated rights of First Nations citizenship along the lines of marriage and progeny for nearly two centuries. Two amendments in particular, Bill C-31, um, 1985, and Bill C-49, 1991, um, continue to regulate in tribal enrollment for women along the lines of marriage, property, and progeny. Um, these two amendments um, were instituted to sort of rectify the wrongs uh, done by the pre you know, the, the previous act, um, but they still raise troubling questions about how Aboriginal women's civic, marital, and reproductive lives are the direct and indirect targets of policy decisions. So prior to 1985, Native women did not retain the right to their matrimonial homes after divorce under the dictates of the Indian Act. Before the onset of, of the two aforementioned amendments, quote, status Indian woman lost status when they married a non-Indian or non-status man. They and their children lost rights associated with their tribal citizenship as defined by the Indian Act and not by their tribal communities. 
in perpetuity, including the right to live on their home reserve, the right to their tribal homeland. The Bill C-31 and Bill C-49 were instituted to um, rectify the wrongs wrought by the original act. They have not altered the basic relationship between First Nations women and the Canadian state. Um, Bill, C B Bill C-31 restores rights to women's shift of status, but not their children or their children's children. And BC-49 regulates marital property and ensures inheritance rights for women as long as the Indian Act is operable. Um, so, and you know, I, I, in my question earlier, I was talking about like how do we imagine the end of, of this of settler uh, colonial reign? So even in <laughs> the act that they were instituted to sort of recuperate um, Native women through their communities, um, it's, all, it's only as long as the, the act itself is instated. Um, for some, Aboriginal identity today is not articulable beyond the terms of such amendments. Mark Rifkin writes, these regulations demand an identification with the terms of settler governance that have produced the very wounding to which these official forms of recognition and belonging appear as a response. Organizations comp composed primarily of women, such as um, the British Columbia Native Women Society, have fought to further amend the Indian Act in court for over two decades. Activist responses often concern housing rights for women and women's representations in tribal electoral governments, which are by no means um, easy or perfect alternative to Canadian parliamentary government. Um, so many activists call for electoral governments to be restructured so that they might more closely reflect traditional forms of governance. And this is particularly because uh, tribal governments today, um, much like the IRA era in the United States are based on the Gradual Enfranchisement Act of Canada um, and I think the Gradual Civilization Act um, of 1857, um, also of Canada, which are both precursors to the Indian Act. The way in which Meyer treats the space of her canvases to mimic scars in Landscape of Sorrow instigates a disruptive melancholy. In the piece, a series of six unprimed rectangular canvases arranged in succession line dis a display wall. Jagged lines stretch to resemble stitched human skin, extend horizontally. The scars form a landscape, a fragmented horizon line abstracted to such an extent that the froze in the canvas that represent torn skin are indistinguishable from the late relationship between line and negative positive space that enables the viewers to perceive the eponymous landscape in the first place. Through the title and in the awkward paunch of canvas stretched taut, the work gives rise to feelings of sadness, um, or at least it does for me. Um, if, as Jonathan Flatley suggests, emotional responses are located not in one's head, or not entirely in one's head, but in the material, in materiality of the object one is responding to, then Yuri's emotional responses to Myers' work are in part located in the pieces themselves. The choice then, the artist's choice, to politicize skin as a site of emotional knowledge and as a plane on which notions of native nationhood might be reinscribed can be construed as a deliberate choice that the artist made to cohere a feeling political community in her viewers. Um, an incantation, excuse me, incantation. Meyer creatively employs the surface of her own skin as a political plane and a site of knowledge. In incapacitation, Meyer's po politics seem to spill over the member's boundaries of her skin, broaching the lines between viewer and artist. It doesn't have sound much in the video. Um, I first came across a short video which documents the artist being tattooed in 2010 as part of the, the exhibit Hide, Skin as Material and Metaphor um, in New York when I was a sophomore in college um, and living back home at the National Museum of the American Indian. The clip picture, and I remember being really entranced by the exhibit itself, and that's when like the, the seeds um, of this project started to germinate. The clip fi features a prolonged close-up of the artist's arm as she is tattooed with the indigenized Can Canadian flag. Blood spurts from her skin, um, the skin of her arm, and is perpetually wiped away, only to emerge again. It is through this process of breaking skin that the image appears, first in its bare geometry, and finally in its finished complexity.
The artist's skin replaces the canvas or page as the plane on which the work is executed, and in so doing becomes the receding negative space of the page while the blood red tattoo is the foregrounded positive image. The skin's ruptures produce a new representation, an imagined indigenous Canada or Canada. Um, and I know this piece in particular is um, in conversation with another um, First Nations artist, Greg Hill, who did a piece um, indigenizing the Can Canadian flag using three feathers rather than the sort of three pronged. The final image of the stark red flag on pale skin inverts our perception of negative and positive space as well as of the relative place of blood and skin. That tattoo, completed in red ink, mimics and mixes with the artist's blood as if the image is carved into her skin with blood rather than with ink. The flag tattoo complicates notions of Canadian and indigenous nationhood, um, their, their complexities and their entwinements. Um, the flag does not represent the artist's Kittigan Zibi tribal community, but rather the three feathers of an indigenous, an indigenized flag, which represent, quote, Indian Inuits and Mintis people of Canada. The film clip is completely silent. There is no audio release from our focus on the image, and the viewer is excruciatingly present with the artist until the tattoo is complete. In the final seconds of the clip, the camera centers the artist's newly tattooed arm, and a quotation appears beneath it. As geography and history reassert themselves, it can be expected that things will change. By framing the clip with a quote from her Tribal Nations website, Meyer links her own skin and blood with her politics, forging a kind of, ge quote, geography of the bo body to further the vision of her Tribal Nation. And the repetition of this um, final image and final text is something that I, I didn't think about. Um, and so it's something I'd also love for you guys to help me think through. Um, why the repetition and what that means. So it is skin itself that seems to trespass temporal boundaries in Nadia Meyer's Everything I Know About Love, which is the first image show, that I showed, um, which engages questions of time relative to embodied knowledge. In Everything I Know About Love, love is treated as an episteme that breaches the boundaries of past events, unreckoned histories and traumas to manifest, manifest as scars on the surface of, of canvas. The title's reference to knowing love bespeaks an emotional knowledge retained in skin. The stories of love, loss, and belonging the skin retains, evinces, or withholds, forms a poetic logic that is not bounded but discursive in its relationship to intimate and estranged others. As the series title, Skin Deep or Poetry for the Blind, indicates, skin is the locus of this poetic logic, but is not bounded by the ocular sense. In the piece, the canvas is partially stitched and a plate to resemble a scar in an indeterminate state of healing. I'm gonna try and pull it up. The scar depicted traverses tra or transgresses what was deemed to be the dead end of the work, the edge of the canvas that frames the image. The scar, a simple organic line, stops forming as it meets the edge of canvas, but the artist has placed a second, structurally identical canvas at its edge. Here, in the blank space of the second canvas, the scar reforms, interrupted by the structured frame, but not entirely discontinuous. Just as the line of the scar continues beyond the borders that frame the event into the space of the second canvas and everything I know about love, the scars that we bear do not necessarily end at a specific point in, in a lifetime or in history, but rather a structured feeling far beyond the temporal end of a traumatic event. Defining place as Coulthard does in Place Against the Empire, as a way of knowing, experiencing, and relating with the world, equip scars to be recuperated so that they may become more than a site of hurt. If place is the crux of politics and theory, quote, emerges from location, then what does it mean for skin to represent place? The perpetual present occasioned by Meyer's use of scars as markers of, trans of temporal trespass, as numerous material that collapses the moments between ongoing settler events and the wounded present. Her work complicates distinctions between place-based feminist politics and a politics-based, a, a temporal politics. To consider scars is to reckon with the wounded present that demands accountability. The scars that skin bears and lays bare can encompass the ugly and the beautiful all at once, the deeply personal memory of a first love that other of her pieces take up, as well as the wounds that are too often the inheritance of native peoples on this continent. 
Meyer's scar work prompts us to consider the implications of something that Akama Pueblo poet Simon Ortiz writes in From Sand Creek, that sometimes violence is even beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> we have time for a few questions. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if melancholy melancholia is the right word to use. I think you might be right, um, particularly because, like, you know, in thinking about melancholy and modernity, um, it is a, sort of this privileged um, position in many ways that one can have time to sort of muse and reflect and be mercurial and all that sort of thing. Um, but I was thinking of it more in terms of. Of, uh, as like a, a geographical mapping in the way in which um, Flatley uses it, um, and and even in like reading other texts like slave narratives, I'm um, thinking of instances in the life of a slave girl. Her sadness, uh, Jacob's sadness, orients her orients her in space, um, and I think it's there's a similar thing going on um, in in Meyer's work. There's a a sadness that orients one to tribal place orients the artist and, and perhaps others for feeling viewers to tribal place, to the knowledge that is right, that it is Canada is indigenous land, for example. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were going to talk about two artists, mm -hmm. and but so you chose to focus on one. I wonder if you could just mention, uh, to talk about the pairing, or who, who the other artist was and then the, how they together. For sure. Um, the other artist is Marianne Nicholson. She's um, also a First Nations artist. Um, and she does these amazing, like almost architectural architectural installations. And I hesitate in using the word installation because they're not always site specific. I, they're not and they're also not always in rooms. Like she did a light in several light installations. Um, and I would her work suggests like the ghostly, uh, far more so, far more so than Meyer's work, which is so much more um, corporeal. Mm 